four of the characters that they play, you know, like, the So, Right. Hi, my name is Carrie Kavache Boyle, and I wanted to say thank you so much for coming out to Skylight Books this evening. Um, yay! <laughs> now, um, before we begin, I have just a couple of things to announce. Um, first of all, I'm thinking of you, and I don't want you to be embarrassed, so please do silence your cell phone right now. And um, second of all, we have all sorts of events uh, multiple times a week. Um, tomorrow, we have uh, Chuck Klosterman, and wow, it's going to be a great show. He's a great reader and um, a lot of fun. Um, next Thursday, we have Moby. And um, in September, we have Jonathan Safran Foyer. So we've got a lot of big events coming up, but um, check us out online. We've got, you know, multiple ones um, every single week. Um, today, of course, we are so excited to have Mark Z. Danielewski um, out with episode three in the multi-volume novel, The Familiar. And um, spoiler alert, I was checking out his Twitter Volume four is already written. Um, so I'll see you guys back here, same place, same time next year. Um, you know, I love to brag about Los Angeles, LA Lit in particular. And um, Mark Danielewski is such a special writer, an LA guy who uh, really embraces his fans and I feel like captures this amazing spirit of possibility in LA. Um, he's been nominated for the National Book Award, winner of the Young Lion Award, beloved by his readers. and. Um, Oh, before I forget, we also have, uh, we found an extra stock of hardcover of um, Only Revolutions for only $6, um, which I had up here to remind you. But um, the new book has gotten wonderfully well reviewed. Um, it has been called Rare, New, Revealing, Apocalyptic, Beautifully Rendered, Painfully Sad, Dazzling, Rollicking, Ambitious, Complicated, Funny, Moving, Sexy, and Beautifully Told. Let's please give him a warm round of applause. Standing outside, I was pretty convinced that this was going to be like a, a sweat lodge meeting. <laughs> so we could commit ourselves to like eight hours and, and get someplace very strange. So, even though there are potentially 27 of these volumes, it's always a, a kind of breathtaking, as in breath stealing moment for me to come out for the first time and sort of hear. Uh, how a book lives um, when it's spoken, you know, and this isn't the end of the tour where I've done it, you know, a dozen times, so it's going to be a, you know, an experience for all of us. <laughs> experience is such a tricky word, right? What does that mean? That could be a really bad experience. <laughs> well, we'll get there. So I thought I'd start with something from House of Leaves. May I? Sure. It was funny that I was writing this in the 80s and 90s, and um, 16 years ago it came out. So I thought I'd read a little from the back, Zampano's notes. July 27th, 1991. Make no mistake, those who write long books have nothing to say. <laughs> of course, those who write short books have even less to say. <laughs> August 7th, 1992. How did I end up here? I know, of course, I'm referring to the itinerary I followed, but that hardly helps me understand the whys any better. I still walk out into that dusty courtyard and stand amazed, amazed that I should have ended up stuck in such a shithole. Then I think to myself, not only did you end up here, you are going to die here. Of course, Hollywood is the land of the blind with churches for the blind, so in my case, it makes certain sense. You think I am bitter about being here, yes? You think I am bitter about this grave I live in and that bed of weeds I scratch around in? You think I am bitter about dying? What do you know? You know nothing about bitterness because you know nothing about love. Get out, get out. No, no, stay. <laughs> Please stay. Let us read something. Forget everything I just said, it's not so bad. I am just old and you know a good deal about love and I would like to think I know something more because of my age. Let us read something. Thank you. 
So this is also kind of dance, right? Because I, I have to read parts that aren't going to give away things. So <laughs> please follow. Uh, this is uh, a Xanther chapter entitled Hyperion. My being can never be washed away. Lone Wolf and Cub, Volume 3. Most dads, when they get a day off to spend with their 11-year-old kid, especially when it's like August and not far away from the kid's birthday, which is like in September, they go straight to Anaheim for Mickey or the Magic Mountain for X2, or at least the Arclight for a Pixar flick, or at the like very, very least, they go to a mall. Dove had taken Xanther to a sewage treatment plant. <laughs> He was on some kind of recruitment training assignment at Fort Irwin, near Barstow, and he drove like three hours to pick up Xanther at 7 a.m., though for Dove, getting up at 4 a.m. was pretty much like sleeping in. Even before she climbed into his Jeep, the question started pouring out. Who was Irwin? Did Fort mean like ones in John Wayne movies they'd watch together? Did the Mojave Desert have sand dunes? And what's a brigade combat team, or even just a brigade? And how does a division mean a bigger thing if it its name means divide. And what, what had Dove done so far? Like yesterday, was he outside the fort on the sand dunes shooting things? To which Dove chuckled and shook his head, and it took Xanther the rest of the drive to figure out that he'd gone to the dentist. <laughs> Xanther didn't like going to the dentist. You know why we floss, kiddo, Dove had asked. <laughs> to get the gunk out, to disrupt the colonies. <laughs> colonies? what's called plaque, sticky stuff that builds up and attacks our teeth. Now trust me when I tell you, young lady, teeth are something you want to take care of. They're these rare white things that give us pleasure throughout our life and give us bite. Our inheritance, our means of survival, our right to rule. Their enamel is the front line, and that line needs to be won every day. Dove's friend, Char, uh, Ralph Cironi, Char, had orchestrated the tour. He was, as he explained, a wastewater operator, grade three solids. He'd worked at the Hyperion treatment plant for the past two years, and he was pretty excited about the place. More so when Dove started firing out his own questions, and boy, did he have a lot. Getting Xanther wondering if maybe she got her question song from him. Dove didn't stop. Everything from gallons per day. 340 million. That'll fill up the Rose Bowl three and a half times, Char had answered proudly. And we can still handle 900 million gallons if it's storm time to service area. Whatever's uphill from us, Venice, Santa Monica, Culver City, Beverly Hills, El Segundo, Glendale, celebrities, they flush their toilets, we get it. To odor treatment, shock dosing like, huh? to manhole cover pick holes, the maze sewer systems, primary treatment versus secondary treatment, Archimedes screw pumps versus waste centrifuges, to chemical agents versus filtration options, to the use of chemicals, ferric and ferrous chloride, as a settling agent. Is that right? Settling verbatim. Char pointed out the on-site uh, cryogenics. See the ice on those pipes? sometimes negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and the five-mile outflow 180 feet down on the sea floor. Dove asked about biodiversity and ecological dead zones. He asked about sludge reduction, thermoclines, heavy metals, and turbidity. How is she remembering all this so um, perfectly? Xanther wore a hard hat to protect her head, more like from all the information than from anything falling. She also had to put on a hairnet. Head lice possibilities, Char explained. Some kids we take through here, you know, for, from some schools, the fact about that, the lice, but also the, the questions Char made out of some of the schools, like Belvedere Middle School, Thomas Star Kane, was alive in her head as they reached the clarifying tanks. There were 36 in all, Char paused by final clarifier 5E, another 16-foot deep circular tank with clear water running over metal teeth before being sluiced over to pumps that took it all out to sea, five miles out. One gull, gull perched curiously in the center. We're going backwards here at your dad's request. 
Next up came a first-hand view of the enormous concrete underworks, a labyrinth dense and hollow lined with pipes. Xanther lost count of the stairs down. Check this out, Char said, pointing back at, co at a concrete hallway that seemed endless. You're looking at two-thirds of a mile straight. Hyperion is the biggest treatment plant west of the Mississippi, 144 acres. They filmed Logan's Run down here, Planet of the Apes, Star Trek, but that's been disallowed since 9-11. No pictures, please. The digesters came next. Talk about strange. 20 huge eggs suspended underground above concrete cups. Four stories underground, but they can withstand an 8.5 earthquake. 2.5 million gallon biosolid capacity, 128 degrees Fahrenheit. Anaerobic bacterial processes. Processes take about three weeks to destroy, destroy I mean, destroy, dyslexic, I guess destroy the pathogens. And the resultant methane that we pipe to the scattergood plant next door helps recover 80% of our energy. We're nearly self-sufficient, said Char. They took the elevator to W. That's for walkway or wow or way up here, Char said, smiling at Xanther. Even if it was a fleeting thing, disconcerted by some whatever Xanther could never guess. Char looked around a lot, like it some old netting near a stairwell because birds flew down into the labyrinth below to build nests. Happy nests. Can't keep nature out. Or at some orange pipes for flaring off the excess gas, steam, silver, effluent is blue. Or toward a grassy dune place fenced off by the sea where shades of sky flitted and settled. The blue butterfly preserve. Maybe Char just needed something to distract him from the smell, which Xanther had noticed kept getting worse and worse. Those air scrubbers, he pointed out proudly, hardly helped, no matter their bleach, caustic, and carbon. Xanther soon had the sleeve of her shirt pressed over her nose and mouth. Not that it helped much. By the loading dock, it was useless. Xanther even tried squeezing her nose through her shirt. Class A biosolids around the clock. Trucks coming and going. That one there, 79,000 pounds gross. Gross was right. Gross black steaming stuff getting shipped north to some farm in Curran County. <laughs> Nothing, though, compared to the headworks. Even Dove pinched his mouth tight. Xanther thought she might throw up. Once Dove had told her a story about a dog that wouldn't stop puking. Staff Sergeant Rensley, through the blunt instrument of his voice alone, trained that dog to keep the puke in his mouth and swallow it. Xanther had been seven at the time when they were living in Athens, Georgia, and she was wetting the bed. The wetting stopped, though never the seizures. No matter how hard Xanther tried to swallow those, anyway, she wasn't a dog. And besides, if Xanther had thrown up at that moment, she wouldn't have swallowed anything. Mm. Xanther would have aimed and not just splashed Dove's shoes, more like chest high, direct hit. <laughs> Char didn't look so comfortable either, and he worked there. Down in this big gray pillar of a building, he seemed even more distracted, eyes dancing everywhere as he mumbled on about more sluice gates, the eight blue bar screens, curiously numbered two to nine, pointing out to the halogeny orange glow of the place where the mechanical teeth dragged out rags, tampons, plastic wrapping, and all the yickety yak, don't talk back crap. Slats of slanted metal drooling brown refuse, biosolids, not shit. Biosolids, not shit, Char kept mumbling as he led them around to the other side, past a pipe label, labeled foul air, to a hole in the concrete slab where all the dark water flowed. Just arriving, still untouched, raw sewage. Where it all begins, where we should have started this tour, Char sighed, checking his phone, his shoelaces, his watch, phone again, some greedy fly buzzing their ears. Muscles in Dove's jaw, big muscles too, began to flex. And then the part that Xanther's mom has always hated, what stands for those two silver bars that stand for captain, snapped sharply into view. Why the hell do you keep jerking your head around like that, Dove barked. Uh... Sorry, Captain. A ADD, I guess. What's that? Uh, attention deficit disorder. That's something diagnosed? 
No, you hear about it, though, online, the news. It means a short attention span. Char nodded, trying to smile. Like, I, I like to channel surf. It drives my wife crazy. That's poppycock. You ain't got no disorder. You just got afraid somehow. Wow, did Char sag then, like a poked balloon too sad to pop. Talk about how badly he wanted to look around then, but he didn't. ADD is just a fancy name for scaredy cat, Dove continued, trying to see what's coming after you, or trying to not see what's coming after you. Private First Class Chironi, I know you better than that. You're no Freddy K. Get back in your skin, look steady, walk ready. Yes, sir. Later, when Dove stepped inside into a restroom, Char had whispered to Xanther, I actually am a scaredy cat, but I'd do anything for him. That means for you, too kind of weird. Char had even looked grateful after Dove got surly, relaxed too, and he definitely didn't fidget as much. But before that, back by the hole, Dove had squatted down and turned all his focus on Xanther. Weird as well, because she also began smiling again. Her strength, which she hadn't even realized had slipped away, returned. All thoughts of revenge vomit vanishing, the smell too. Xanther dropped her shirt sleeve from her face. You're not afraid either, kiddo. Stare a thing in the eye, know it, and let it know you know it too before you let it go. You're a mud, don't forget. Xanther near, nearly shouted, yes, sir, jubilant, jubilantly too. Instead, she did something she's only managed a few times in her life. She looked straight back at those flint eyes and didn't stop looking until Dove blinked and even looked away. Had he been afraid? Well, he sure was smiling, winking then and softening fast before nodding one last time at the sickening flow running beneath them a few feet away. Awful kiddo, isn't it? And by all measures of decency, we shouldn't be here. We should be at Disneyland or stuffing buttered popcorn in our yaps. But I don't get to see you so much, what with my line of work, where I go, what I'm meant for. What Char here had the smarts and courage to get out of. Dove looked at his friend. I mean that, Char. You served honorably. I'm proud to have called you one of my men before returning to Xanther. So, kiddo, I don't want to waste what few hours we have together pretending the world's some ride with guardrails. I want to respect your time, even though you're 10 or 11, <laughs> even though you might not get this now, but maybe will later. Actually, this is where she dropped her sleeve. So I want to tell you something I know to be true tell you something that shapes what I do. And it's not particularly sweet, and some might even say it's a little cruel. If less distracted, Char was back to looking uneasy. There's a lot of talk about unity and oneness, especially that Buddhist bullcrappy, which you'll come across soon enough, as well as other hippie garbage your mom likes to think she believes in. Anwar, too. Heck, don't get me wrong. I'd like to believe it, too. But the way the world works, that's not what I see. That's not what I know. I've been to China, India, I've walked their roads of enlightenment, but all I saw was disease, destitution, and delusion, and a total disregard for the individual, a regard that makes this country we live in the best there is, a light on the hill, a miracle to the world. So I brought you here this morning to show you unity, oneness, a mix of everything, from the purest water to the foulest excretion the mind can imagine, a population saliva, defecations, urinations, blood, vomit, and tears, Dead rats, dead birds, garbage disposal pulp, drug deals gone wrong, body parts, solvents, things as benign as newspapers and cotton swabs, up to perfectly fine, unconsumed food. Probably perfumes too, expensive perfumes. You name it, some of it's in here. And what does it make? That's right, kiddo, this. Not so pretty, huh? This is a world without boundaries. This is what happens when there are no divisions. Look at it, Xanther. Breathe it in. Never forget. This is what you get when there is no law. This is what you get when the teeth lose. <laughs> is right that um, when we argue with others, it's rhetoric, and when we argue with ourselves, it becomes poetry, then I think when we're arguing with ourselves, with others, that's what <laughs> literature does. <laughs> and the point is, is that we can hear voices that we don't always agree with, 
but they could still be as impassioned about, you know, about the world that they see. And those of you who've started on this adventure realize that The Familiar is composed of, of mainly nine characters and that each chapter is their voice. It's their, it's their point of view. And how they harmonize or jangle with one another is kind of the point. So for this last little bit here, I'm going to read uh, from a chapter uh, by Esther, Xanther's mom. And she's um, attempting to make amends to her daughter. I won't tell you why. Um, and so she's taken her on a field trip to a place um, north on the Five that uh, houses wild animals that are used in Hollywood. <laughs> Seeing that the second big cage holds only dogs, Esther asks Cashel to, di to direct her toward a restroom. But on her way there, Stare for a moment doubts the way, fears she will have to make do off to the side, squatting behind some tarantula-owned rock until she spots across a road and down some steps, just as Cashel promised, the small house. The door's unlocked, no one's in. A gloomy place, distressed shag maroon carpet disappears to die beneath heavily shellacked bookcases loaded with veterinarian books. The immediate kitchen is a narrow alley of stove and sink, counter crowded with bottles of hydrogen peroxide and tubes of neosporin, scissors too beside rolls of medical tape and wads of gauze, brown enough to keep a stare from investigating further. On the wall is a critter gitter clock, time at the service of a lion and a hyena with an elephant stampeding the second hand. The bathroom is just as overwrought, encrusted with dirt, which a stair determines with a fingernail is no such thing, unless years of hardening have produced this current dark epoxy. Everything else is leopard. Leopard wallpaper, leopard towels, leopard candles, and even a leopard toilet seat. A stair hovers. She also never nears the sink, those smeared faucets. A tarantula-infested rock would have been better. The only thing she touches on her way out is the light switch, leopard. Is this where Abigail revels in her sweet sweat semen-soaked entanglements? Stare wants to gag. She's nowhere close to gagging. What could have possessed Abigail to have even cross the threshold? Is she really this lonely? A stare doesn't even realize how tight her chest has gotten like a man's fist, she imagines, until she steps outside Something about the dinginess offends her. Esther isn't even thinking of the jeans and boxers huffed over the hair matted sofa or the muddy boots on the coffee table. She's thinking about all of it. The stink for sure, for sure. She sneezes now twice more, her throat itches, eyes to allergies. Still better than the way she felt inside, flushed, envious. Something's at her feet. Can she even call it a cat? What a grizzled thing, gray with just a glint of green in one eye. The other eye is marble white, ick. The ear above the ick, ick is no more than a hole surrounded by spidery threads of flesh. The whole left side is nothing more than a few tufts of ashen hair, except where, where there is no hair at all. A substantial trench digs alongside the spine, through the ribs and down into the rear flank, rendering a back leg pretty useless. The tail is just gone. Nonetheless, this tortured thing rubs against Astaire's ankle, even after she recoils. It's mew, or is it a purr, a harsh grate of improbable survival, only stops when nearby, very nearby, just up the hill, crowned in brush, something else unleashes its thunder. Astaire feels gripped by the bones, the teeth. What the fuck was that? What, what Astaire has every intention of asking Cashel as she's letting herself through the big gate, only to freeze at the sight of Gus and Vito and Juno frozen before that last big cage. Something about that last cage now beginning to dawn on Astaire, along with, where is Cashel? Where is Xanther? Dark shapes moving inside, way, way bigger than dogs. Not dogs at all.
A stare is sprinting, breath quickening, already breathing way too hard until she's not even breathing. Another fist in her chest, this one a much different kind, as a stare reaches the fencing to discover yellow eyes and a swirl of black fur and teeth clicking in low guttural growls. Wolves, five of them and all circling frantically and shaking their heads repeatedly and lunging out suddenly to snap before withdrawing just as fast to continue circling. And the center of their attention, the object of these attacks, her baby girl, sitting cross-legged alone until adrenaline sharpens Astaire's perceptions. Cashel's in there too with a baton, but, but cornered by the biggest wolf, no, not the biggest. The biggest has just clamped its jaws on her daughter's arm, twisting to rip it away, rip it off, tear Xanther apart. Mom, Xanther cries, which is when everything goes messy. Adrenaline replaced, gushing for nowhere now, against conflicting sights and tones. Saliva returns to Astaire's mouth. The beating in her chest slows as her body starts to relax, even if her mind persists in trying to command all of her to keep tensing, tense still more, do this something more, damn it. Mom, Xanther cries again, come in. Cashel looks just as happy. That second biggest wolf before her, a blur of charcoal and snow, has just rolled over, wanting something from Cashel to play with, while the biggest wolf with Xanther, a blonde billow of heavy shoulders and bright eyes, continues to rip away at what's only a frayed blanket, red, which Xanther playfully withholds until overpowered she lets go with a squeal. Aren't they amazing? They are but they think she's more amazing. Cashel notices it too, especially when Xanther stands up. Immediately, Cashel's attendant, attendant, wolf, wheels around to rejoin the pack, fall in behind the blonde alpha who pays no mind to the rest, paying close attention only to every move the stairs 12-year-old makes. Only Xanther's oblivious, practically skipping across the cage to meet a stare at the gate. The blonde alpha drops his prized blanket to keep close to Xanther, too close teeth nearly nicking those fragile heels, even as the pack hangs back, if still tuned to the flitting motion of Xanther's hands, her head bobbing and dancing knees, as if they soon might earn some anticipated reward. She's special, Cashel says later, after Xanther goes to find the bathroom. I'm partial, Astaire responds, her practiced tone of neutrality in effect. You start together, Cashel continues in her tone, leaking with confession or just curiosity. That's the way you're supposed to start, because I mean, they know me. And then you sit down so you're lower than them or the same height, but not higher, which would make you maybe more leaderish and definitely more of an outsider. But when you're down low, then they treat you like part of the pack. And they come around and sniff you and even pull at that blanket I let your daughter hold. And then you stand up like I stood up to be leaderish, see? And I kind of moved away, which is when they usually all follow me. Except this time only Montana followed me and it was like, Cashel's smile changes. Huh, it was like he wasn't really following but more trying to separate me and you know, keep me away. Kind of like the way someone might do at a party, pull someone away so the rest can have a private conversation. Actually, now that I think about it, it was really weird. Astaire's heart is at it again, adrenaline back too, except this time, instead of confusion, it's all about anger. Cashel has no clue. They just took to her, the young woman continues. I mean, took to her. Did you see at the end how she got up and they all fell back like all at once? And Montana left me quick and like even Quasar, the alpha healed behind her? I've worked with them for three years now and they never, do that for me. Not even toys, Cashel whispers the last part. Not in that way. It's like they knew her. Like she was one of them, or all of them, I mean, but in charge, you know? <clears throat> Cashel suddenly chuckles, loud too, abrasively. Man, I must be beat. It sounds like I'm calling your kid a werewolf. <laughs> all Astaire wants to do is beat Cashel even envisions a flurry of fists beating her into bruises and pus, though not with Astaire's fists, but heavier and calloused and backed up by the brute strength and brute experience, fists she knows too well because they're doves. At least Astaire should shout, how dare you fucking take my 12-year-old daughter into a den of fucking wolves without my fucking permission and dress her up like fucking Little Red Riding Hood? Are you fucking kidding me? They're a lot like dogs, Astaire says instead. 
The question has the desired effect. Confidence from expertise dispels Cashel's evident unease. They look like dogs, sure, but they're not. See the yellow eyes, the size, and the tails? They never lift the tails above their backside. They're smart, too. Way smarter than your average pooch. You have to trick them to do anything. They won't serve any man, ever. At least that's what Toys said. He should know. They only serve the pack. Astaire still can't help but see dogs, even as she sees nothing close to dogs. Actually, the only thing Astaire can see is red. Before Cashel leaves, still clueless, she again announces that Toys is only minutes away. Traffic. Xanther and Astaire are welcome to hang out with the dogs or kick back in the mini barn office. With Xanther out of earshot, backed by the monkeys, Cashel also asks, so to Voce too, that Astaire not mention, you know, that thing with the wolves? That thing? There's supposed to be all this release of liability paperwork to fill out, and anyhow, you know your daughter, right? Astaire tries to crush every answer, only one between her teeth grinding away like she so often tells Xanther not to do, though something in her expression still betrays her. Cashel's eyes widen, her youth suddenly too evident on her soft features. You do know I didn't take her in there, right? I was feeding havoc. She was talking to them, and then she just walked in. Later, long after Cashel's dirty white Corolla left in a specter of dust, what Astaire keeps turning over in her head is not this revelation, but a different warning. Xanther had returned from the bathroom slightly spooked. What's up the hill? Yeah, Cashel had tensed. Don't go up there, okay? Please don't. Thank you. Questions? No questions. What's up the hill? It's in here. <laughs> but that's always the question, right? What's up the hill or down the hill? What are you reading? My reading right now. Um, I'm reading about drones. I'm reading a book uh, called Manhunt about the history of predation. Repeat the last part, I can't read. Sure. Uh, the question is, what was the initial inspiration for this series? And, um, and then what's the outlet line like? Uh, well, I started this back in 2006. So it took me almost 10 years. I guess that's something I like uh, <laughs> to get volume one out. And you know, I think we're all kind of we're all of us are endowed with something we can do and something we're afraid to do. And this particular story, not with all its manifestations and voices and whatnot, but but the nature of Xanther's relationship to this cat and, and what this cat is began a long, long time ago. It actually predates House of Leaves. Mm. And I think we all have this thing like, I should do that, right? Like, I, you know? And, you know, we get those ideas and, and then sometimes we forget them and we realize it. But, but then there are those, those things that just keep coming back. And, um, and usually if they're important, they come with a sense of fear. And I think this one had that. It was, I don't, I think it's too much for me. I think it's, it's beyond what I can do. Um, but it keeps kind of digging its claws in and kind of like, it never puts you out of its misery. You kind of want a, a great idea to just snap your neck and you're done. You've had that idea, enlightenment, take me out of here. Instead, it just kind of just gnaws on you, you know, and sort of keeps you alive. And, um, and so then what you realize is, Outlines are important, but they're also a way of pretending that you're not going to go to this place. You're not going. It's like drawing a map without 
visiting that continent. You know, at a certain point, you just have to go and land on the shores and kind of go, all right, I'm going to make a map as I go along. And the map that I thought was right is not right, so I have to redesign the map. So a lot of that happened. And, you know, the, the basic gig for a writer is you just have to write. You have to write a lot all the time. And you have to be willing to, like, throw stuff away and, you know, um, bring it back to life. And, and so um, as it began to take shape, as its kind of its structure began to tell me what it was, that it was, that it was this serial, you know, that was, kind of, that was eventually based on a television show. I mean, the idea of a television show where every five volumes is, is one season. Mm. Um, then that began to sort of, you know, sort of lead me into the fact that there's 30 chapters, you know, it's, there's 880 pages per volume. There's a certain structure, a certain set of limitations that sort of constrain it. At the same time, it's so huge that almost anything can kind of enter it, you know? So you're constantly revising your maps, but you need them at the same time. And, um, and I think the biggest thing was that with House of Leaves and Only Revolutions, there was a sense about both those books that, that were complete unto themselves, you know? And, um, and that became troubling for me because I felt that in the end I was gonna end up in a little shack in Montana all by myself, you know, writing something that would, you know, not include anyone else. And so a lot of this book is about making those life choices that open the windows and open the doors and suddenly say, okay, this series isn't going to live without you. Just like Xanther is the one that's going to help that cat live, you know. You are the collective Xanther in a way. You can command the pack. Maybe you are the pack. Um, so you just mentioned about um, a, a story including sort of an outside element to it. There are so many different voices in here that all sound really authentic, at least to me. What is, how do you research something like that to give it that authenticity? You know, how do you write for an 11-year-old girl but then also for a computer programmer and, you know, all of these different cultural things? Like, right. It's got to be... <laughs> it's got to be intense. Yes, it's very intense. Um, the question was, how, how do I write all these different voices? And um, the answer is exactly what you said. There's, there is a lot of research, you know. I had, to, uh, I had to go to Singapore, you know. I had to talk to people who speak Singlish. Now, by the way, it's not English pidgin. You see that a little online. It's, it's English. It's its own type of, of lingual fantasia, and it's amazing. <laughs> um, there is uh, an engineer that's credited at the back. Like a television series, there are actually a lot of credits at the back of each volume because I call them up and we talk about you know, different programming languages and we talk about the, the program that's actually being written in the book. And this gets back to that scary little log cabin because it's, maybe it's not even logs, too. it's just like slats of old <laughs> cedar, you know, that can't really even keep out the, the cold. But, you know, it, 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 I knew that in order to write this, I would have to talk to people from <laughs> Egypt. I would have to talk to people who could tell me about the Egyptian idiom of Arabic, you know, which was so far from me. But this seemed to me a healthy direction. As scary as it was, it meant that I had to encounter other people. I had to talk to people who have epilepsy. I had to talk to doctors. I had to talk to parents, you know. And over the years, there's this kind of, you know, accretion, I guess, of details, you know. And I think in the end, as important as all of that tiny stuff is, what's also important is that, and this is what I want to give to the reader, is that there's this experience of hearing all the voices in one place. I mean, I think what I have taken issue with in literature is the monolithic voice, because I love the monolithic voice. You know, whether it's Emily Dickinson, whether it's Proust, whether it's Pynchon, you know, it's, it's, the, it's that music that kind of organizes the whole world for you, right? It just kind of like 
you know, just brightens it up and, and, and it kind of makes sense of it and it keeps you safe. Um, but it's not true. You know, there isn't one voice that's going to organize this world, you know. There, the one voice is out there, and it's that wild cacophony. And, and right now, it's the beginning of the series. We're, of course, focusing on these human voices, but the voices are, are go way beyond the human, you know. We, we need to listen to the way storms talk to mountains and, you know, and, and seedlings drop and, and touch the earth, you know. And so that's part of the, the research as well. Dove definitely believes in his point of view that this is what unity looks like, but we've heard that before, but maybe Dove's not right, you know? Maybe unity has a different sound, you know, a different look, a different smell. Is there a question? Yes. Um, okay, so um, I'm always fascinated by the fact that there's so much going on in the And the, the, start, the starting point of the question was, how do we talk about this book? And then you began to answer that question, because it is complicated to talk about something with many parts. But that's also the practice, right? Because we live in a world where we have to talk about multiple parts. And then you got specific. And that's great, too. But you didn't want to get to the specific question, because you knew that I wasn't going to answer the specific <laughs> question. <laughs> and you're like, this sort of sucks. but. Yeah, you know, and I, I think that there is, I think it was very, it was lovely to share that you were in AA because there is a quality to this work, which I'm seeing now, that, that is very intimate. Like all the characters, you know, from how Esther is dealing with her toilet seat or how she feels that where her friend is having her, her you know, her romantic episodes is just disgusting, even though there's part of her that's like also denying how exciting it is that there's an animal trainer in her friend's life, you know, is all kind of, you know, about a kind of openness that can be sort of frightening. But good luck with the end papers. They are important, and I still have 24 books left, so um, I would say you're on the right track. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, each of your books is so completely unique and different, so my question is, how has how does your process for each book? How is it different um, between the book that you've written and then on top of that, which process of which book have you enjoyed yourself writing the most? So what is my process? Because the books are all different, and and do I have a favorite one? Um, 
Well, one of my my favorite quotes is by the haikuist Basho, Basho, who was writing at the time that Shakespeare was writing. And his, his minimal example is a great counterpoint to what Western literature can look like, look like. And he said, avoid adjectives of scale, i.e. like better or worse or favorite or not favorite. Um, you will desire the world less and you will love it more. So that means is the whole thumbs up or thumbs down or it's awesome. You're really not giving anything, any, anything to anyone, right? You're just kind of stoking their desire, their envy, their whatever it is. But if you say, oh, there's this amazing moment where these two blueberries are sitting on the edge of a plate and suddenly something jars the plate that we can't see and they kind of roll down the plate together. Like, you've had a meal right there, you know? So the process is about living. It's about recognizing that how you live your life and how the direction you move, the mistakes you make, the relationships at work that don't, you know, um, is part of every book. So I just want to reflect those changes that are going on in me, you know? And I, I was in my late teens, early 20s when I was writing House of Leaves. Now, there are a lot of authors, there's a lot of artists who basically just find their gig and then they just kind of repeat it. And then there's that painful thing that we all start to feel like, oh man, he's 60 and he's trying to write like a 19 year old, you know? And, <laughs> and I don't think that's very fair, you know? So I think for me, it's always a process of how I'm living my life, how this changes, you know? For you know, for the familiar, I needed an atelier. I needed people that I could work with that, that involved a certain amount of socializing that made me uncomfortable, you know? Um, and I think that's something that's available to every single person, whether you're creative or not, is to allow the process of your own life to, to be part of what you are, you know, bringing forth for other lives. Yes? Well, you kind of took one of my questions, or oh, my only question, but um, I guess another question uh, would be um, what other things have, I guess, okay, because your books, like, they pretty much take you out of your own reality and, like, put, like, get sucked into, like, you know, this, the, um, the protagonist, you know, like, the world and everything. And, like, what kind of things, I guess, uh, outside of, you know, just writers or, um, or other stories that you've heard, I guess, have, you know, inspired you to, like, like, I guess, okay, like, for, I, I, I don't have the pleasure yet of uh, reading familiar yet. I have only one in my purse. <laughs> it's about it. Big um, purse. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, just like, um, just just all the imagination. I've never seen a book like like House of Blues, and I just, like, I just, if there's maybe one thing you can point that just made you kind of just not give a damn of, you know, like, a, of what's already been done and just kind of make it your own original, like, just whole, like, I think, I think of it as, like, just a whole art project in general, you know. So the question is, are my books just large art projects? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, he was, the one that he said is a little bit more narrow about, like, you know, which books have inspired. No, me. but no, no, I like what you're saying because I think, I think the reason that House of Leaves and these books have found a readership is because it's something that we all at least the readers of those books relate to, you know? At a certain point, we're like, oh no, I wanna draw this on the side, or I wanna include this image, and, and we can see how social media is actually trapped with that, right? Like now it's much more easy to put, you know, images in a blog, or like to, to, to codify those images, and, and, um, and so I think just, it really was sort of like a, a thick-headedness on my part that said, no, I'm going to put a picture here. I know I'm not supposed to, or I'm going to write the text upside down because it feels like it should be upside down. And if you turn your head this way, it's going to kind of make sense, right? You know, or this kind of color, you know, like to put red up when you're talking about blue or something like that, those kind of dissonances, all of which are becoming more evident as people, as we study the psychology of color and how we, how we, um, how we frame things and profile things and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, I guess I just, I did it, and I keep doing it. Um, it's a complicated thing to do. I kick myself a lot because it's, it's an enormous amount of work. It's very, very intense. Um, but it's, it's very gratifying. And it is the way I see the world and the way I hear the world. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to, um, as days, my question off of the, mm -hmm. um, the idea of, contradiction 
his work, I want to hear more about this sort of disruptive contradiction, right? Mm -hmm. So first it's like a measurement that's just slightly off. And enough, I mean, it could have been a centimeter. would have been enough to destroy all the lawfulness. Right. Now, all taste is a centimeter. Then it gets more extreme, but that centimeter opens up you know, a pool that's almost like those bug bunny cartoons where he's running down the hall and pulls out a piece of chalk at the brick wall and right. draws a door and then walks through it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I want to know about that sort of tension that, I mean, I see it in uh, the Deer stories. I haven't started from there yet, right. but I see it, you know, showing up in that sort of idea of disrupting things with sort of one thing that's off. Right. Um, and do you want that effect also in the world <laughs> to sort of mess up the lawfulness? So the question of contradiction, the question is, I guess, do I purposefully put something off to kind of mess things up, right? In the book and then for So I'm the guy who's looking at the engine that's running beautifully and just <laughs> drops the marble right in the gears, right? Um, I guess it's the, you know, it's, we have a, I mean, our, our mind is so limited. It's so amazing, but at the same time, it's so limited com compared to the great gyres of the universe, universes that surround us, right? And, um, and if we really just face that disruptive focus, you know, I mean, um, that disrupted storm that surrounds us, that still kind of works, with maybe us in mind now and then, and maybe not us in mind at all, uh, I think it would overwhelm us. So one of the things we do is we create, we, we find patterns. We're great at pattern recognition. So we can find things that work for us, you know? And we know that at a certain, at a cer in a certain month, you know, uh, a fruit will appear on this tree and we'll be able to eat. And we recognize and we can simplify that process. But of course, things can change the outcome of that tree's blossoming droughts, earthquakes, you know, just the natural course of this fruit tree's life. I want, I'm thinking of blueberries, but blueberries don't grow on a, on a tree. <laughs> we'll change it to a blueberry tree. Um, and so what I think is that what I'm constantly pursuing is how we create these remarkable languages and lenses and God forbid, sacred text to organize the world and tell us, like, this is how it works. And if it's not working that way, then there's something wrong with it. But that's not, that's not the truth that I see. So usually when I hear, when the question you're asking is like, the contradiction is not in the world in which we're, we're fortunate enough to inhabit, but it's in a certain doctrine or document that we've manifest that we're, that we're saying, in June, those big blueberries are going to be on that big tree, right? Because we haven't really quite seen yet that the tree is not a tree and the blueberries maybe aren't blueberries, something else. So I guess that was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK, yes. So um, this is maybe a little related. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about structure that was related to the pieces that you chose for tonight. Mm -hmm. um, because what I found, there, there are some interesting echoes in the two passages. So, um, first we have teeth, mm -hmm. and then we have canines. Right. And we talk about cats. Mm -hmm. Then we have colonies of plaque and teeth that mm -hmm. are somehow undermining the stability of the canine organization. Right. And then we have the kind of uh, the pack. Right. And so I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about those kinds of echoes and how they work. Because I see them making their way through the familiar mm -hmm. as a much more subtle kind of structure than, say, the, the kind of almost geometrical organization of something like only revolutions. Right. So, so the comment, very astute reader here, <laughs> um, just noticing that in the two passage, passages that I read, this question of the canine, canine tooth, and how canines appear at the, in the second segment, and the question of how these things echo. You know, we even have an appearance of dove, and then we have the echo of a stair seeing dove in a different way. 
um, not nearly as amiably as, as, as Xanther. Um, but yes, teeth are, teeth are a big deal. And what you're starting to tease out is kind of like, well, what do we do with weaponry, right? What do we do about these, these things that, that, that allow us to eat comfortably, that are seductive, that, um, that, can, that can, you know, they're, they certainly, they reflect an earlier day when they were these violent instruments, you know, that were capable of, of protecting us or, or bringing down some animal. And I think, you know, again, this is, this is a big project and it is a project about the world and its, its echoes are about how, 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 how there are these, these natural, um, I hesitate to say commonality because it's more complicated than that, but it's, there are these natural organizations, I think, that, that kind of, that, that allow us to hear echoes, right? But at the same time, there are also these disruptions that take place, right? And, and, um, but they, they remain unresolved in, in three. <laughs> well, actually, not quite. Actually, no. I mean, I, I think the thing is, is at the very end of volume three, Xanther has a revelation that's very different from her parents. It's very different from the pack, and it's very different from the, the wolves. Um, but I can't read that part. But I think that's the answer, really, to your question. So I'm kind of dancing around something that I think is, is very material and obvious. Um, but I don't want to give away sort of the philosophical treatise of volume three. <laughs> yeah, so hands disappear and then they come up and I'm like, we're done. Um, all right, right here. So a little simpler, yeah. I guess, but what book or what in general would you say sparked your love for reading? And then what book or what in general sparked your love for writing? Love of reading, what, was the, what were the books that sparked my love of reading and my, my love of writing? Um, well, the first book I ever read was Charlotte's Web. And curiously, I saw the movie first. And I remember my mom saying, you know, it was a book. I was like, really? So I had to go backwards, you know. Maybe that's why I don't sell the film rights to House of Leaves. It's just, <laughs> it was like, book is so much better. Um, and I think writing was always there. I think writing is a little more complicated. My family moved around a lot, and I, I, I realized that that was one thing that I could always be responsible for, that I could do. It didn't matter if I was on a train or if I was in a different country or, you know, or if I was rich or poor. It was just it was something that I that was was a, a way that I could put out sort of a creative, um, I don't know, template of my, my thoughts and my feelings. And in some way, I feel blessed by that because it was simple. It was like I'm going to put words together. That's that's what I want to do. Um, but it's not by far the only way to 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 manifest your creativity. And, um, and it is an interesting period we're living in because there's so many different ways to, to, to access that, that impulse and, and to arrange it, you know, whether it's online or it's, you know, with, with images and texts or however it's done, you know. So, good luck. <laughs> yes. How do I maintain my motivation and discipline? I think discipline is my real gift. I think I have always been capable of doing that. But I think it is very hard in the beginning. And I think, I think what does it is when you start to create a world or you start to create characters or what, however, however you're, you're framing it, if you work on it enough, it, it gains its own mass and it has its own gravity and you're helpless before it. Like for me to let go of, of Xanther and her family and this little cat is just, I, I have to get there. I mean, really the question is like, what do you do at around 4.30 or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock until 5 in the morning the next day when you're going to write? You know, this is when writers become alcoholics, actually, by the way. It's always like, you know, when you're young, it's always like, I'm going to get hammered and I'm going to write something. No, really, it's so exciting to write that it's, what do you do with all that excitement? Like afterwards, you're like, oh God, I need a bourbon or something, and that's how you destroy yourself. But, <laughs> so I think that is the, for me, it's not a discipline anymore. I have to go there, you know, but you know, it's like, 
to make sure my cats are okay, and people <laughs> I love are okay, you know. So I guess I, I love what I do. I love I love that world, and so I have to I have to be there for for it. So maybe it isn't a discipline. Maybe it's an affection. Mm -hmm. The very back. Yeah, you brought up earlier how important it is as a writer to know when to cut things. Mm -hmm. And so because you've already given out this is going to be 27 volumes and eight volumes and 800 pages, how has that affected you? Like, do you become self-conscious about cutting things now in ways that you maybe weren't before? How has that affected you? Go a little further, like cutting, cutting what? Like, well, for example, if you get year two, volume 24 or 25, right. you realize you can finish it by volume 25, and it doesn't need to be 27 volumes, what then do you do? And is that an option? God, that would be great. <laughs> if I could wrap this all up in volume four, that would be amazing. No, it's it's too well known. I know the ending. Like I know all the parts and how they bring together, how they come together. So that part is impossible. However, the um, the fact is there is a lot of cutting that goes on. Like volume one, I think I cut about a hundred thousand words. That's like two great Gatsby's, mm -hmm. just to give you an idea, you know. <laughs> Volume four, I think, was probably about ten or twenty thousand words. So I'm learning, you know, what I what I could do. And as much as there is, you realize also, like, oh, these characters have a certain life. Like Jing Jing deals with certain subjects. Schnork deals with certain subjects. You know, there there is a certain limitation to it. And yet, and yet, at the same time, there's also a way of opening things up and you know, and bringing new things in or, or letting them go. The the sewage treatment plant was cut three times and brought back to life, you know? It was one of those things I was, oh, it goes, it doesn't, you know? It was supposed to go in volume one, I think, and didn't make it, and then it kind of like one of those growly, gnawing ideas. I was like, but wait, you know, it comes back. And so then in volume two, and then I was like, no, it's dead, it's gone. And then I was like, okay, in three. It's I'm glad it made it. <laughs> yes. So you talk about how like you've been thinking about these books for ten years and like right. meditating on the ideas and then writing them for ten years. Writing them, for not 10 just years. meditating on them. Yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> big uh, difference. So, uh, so like when I'm reading through and I see like ties into like YouTube and texts mm -hmm. and like Rihanna lyrics, how do you decide like I've been working on this for ten years and like a song lyric that came out two years ago is worth putting into this work right. that I've been working on for so long? Like, how do you make that decision? Great question. So how do I make a decision what to include on something that's this big? And, um, and that's the fun, you know? Part of it is getting back to the question about process. I mean, my father was a filmmaker, mm -hmm. and he ended his life being the head of the USC um, theater department. Mm -hmm. But back in the 50s, he was part of Actor Studio. So he worked with all those guys, and then he formed his own professional acting workshop. And he was method. You know, if you were going to do a part, you embrace that part. So part of the process was to embrace the, you know, this thing. You know, I became, I mean, this may be shocking, but I was wearing cat t-shirts way before there were cat t-shirts. Everyone thought that was really weird. And I'm almost, I, I almost lost it, basically. Everyone said, oh, everyone wears cat t-shirts or, or whatnot. Um, so I think you, you, you know, you live with it and... That's all I can say. You live with it, you love it, you work with it, and and you live with it. <laughs> Couple more questions. There was one. Quick question. Okay. <laughs> Repeat question. Here we go. <laughs> uh, just really quick. Uh, you said about um, making the rights for like House of House of Leaves. Anyone like pitched you to like make a movie out of that? Yes. Yeah. There's there's always interest every year. You know. Oh, wow. I just yeah. <laughs> I want to have I'll have the conversation. You know. If P. T. Anderson wanted to have a conversation about it, I'd have a conversation. <laughs> it doesn't get to that point though. It's it's available. Yes. What is your favorite line you've ever written? Remember my quote about favorites yeah. and Basho? I can't decide that. <laughs> What's your favorite line? Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes. Uh, so in Only Revolutions, you have this timeline in the inside margin. Right. And in this book, you have the geometric sort of design that follows the text. Um, firstly, what do you call that design in the, in the scene of your book? 
and in only revolutions? In, no, in this book. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not going to tell you. It's a good question, though. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. okay. um, They're you. not breadcrumbs, though. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Okay. That's helpful. That's helpful. My OCD. Um, then could you talk about why you put them in there? Like, what's your, do you? Yeah. So the, the, the question is, what does a specific graphic element mean in the familiar? And that's what I said I'm not going to answer or tell you. Um, but, you know, I think people who, those of you who read my books and who've read reviews probably notice that some people are really adept at writing about what's textually going on, and some people are adept at writing what's visually going on. But there are really not a lot of critics that are sort of out there that are trained. And I'm not talking about better or worse or whatnot. I'm just talking about an analysis of what's going on when you start to have figurative language next to actually figurative compositions. Um, and it's complicated. And it, it, it's a lot of work in developing all of that, developing the colors and the designs and how they integrate on a narrative level and how they also integrate in a way that is visually impactful. You know, Those who have read volume three now can identify very quickly who the characters are. You know, it's all of that information is immediately served. To, it makes your life easier. But of course, when you read volume one for the first time, you're like, what is this? Like, I don't know where we, where we are, you know? So it creates a kind of familiarity. So that visual architecture is a way to sort of, yes, to destabilize in some ways the way we read things, but then also in some ways to render them, you know, um, more compassionately available to the reader. That was a total dance around her question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Is there a precedent for books that are not the original story 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 that the the calligraphs of, of Apollinaire, what Mallarmé was writing, um, <laughs> The, I mean, I think we can even go back to the sort of tablatures of, you know, classical Western civilization of how things were sort of designed on, you know, slabs of, of marble. Um, I think, you know, in, in some ways I am a product of my technology. I mean, Faulkner wanted to, to I think the book was finally released act, actually where he wanted to include different characters in different colors, but it just simply wasn't available. But you know, when I came into the world, I was lucky to have that little Mac that had a little font list and I could pull down and change the font. And that was a no-no for the teachers, but it was still a way of, 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 of getting at that. Um, I will say this, I've been asked by a few people to write that essay. And I should write the essay that you're asking me about, which is, what is that list? Because it is a long list. I mean, there are a lot of people who worked with visual elements and text. and. You know, whether it's concrete poetry, whether even you look at pop art, whether you're looking at Jenny Holzer or Basquiat even, like what is that play of text and, and image? Um, but in some ways, I think the familiar is that essay. Like, do I really want to stop that or do I want to say, well, this, I am making that, that exploration apparent, you know? All right, one more question. That's a lot of pressure. Huh? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I teach architecture at the University uh, in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And one of the seminars that I teach, we look at how architecture appears in different types of literature. And the students always go gaga when they read House of Leeds. And they invariably start to model the conundrums that formulated um, writing in physical space. I'm curious if you've ever explored that yourself. If I, if I have, excuse me? If you've ever, whether House of Leeds or other ideas, you mean to physically en yeah. envision them? Well, I think I do it with all all my books, really. I mean, I mean, do you mean actually model them? Is that what you? Yeah. That's like? what they're doing with your book. That's pretty. You got some pretty gifted <laughs> students. <laughs> um, I guess I I think my material is the book, so there really isn't that much time to actually make that adaptation, whether it's a film or a model or, you know. I mean, 
with only revolutions, I did create like Mobius strips, you know, in, in a way. And, and actually, I did storyboard House of Leaves because it, it, it has a, a cinematic function as much as, as an architectural one. So seeing how the pages kind of move the eye around. Um, and there is a lot of that in, um, in the familiar. I love to see those models. It sounds pretty cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.